So um, before we get started, so last time we kind of covered in video some techniques and that kind of stuff. Uh, we're actually going to dive into the gear in this uh, session. So I uh, just want to kind of show some cameras off real quick to give you like, there's a wide variety of different cameras and camera types. And then we'll kind of step through like every single camera has these, this category of, of stuff. And so hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, this is a Canon uh, 70. Um, so this is just like a um, photo camera, but I can also record video. Um, so that's that one. This is a 5D Mark III. This is another one. This is kind of a step up from uh, this guy. And I'll explain why in, in a moment. This is a black magic camera, a little form, that's called a pocket cinema camera. So it just has um, some different capabilities that, than these two have. You guys probably all recognize this little guy right here. He's really cute. Um, really fun for action type stuff. Over here we have, this is our Hitachi uh, Z HD 5000. And this, these, this is the camera that we use on weekends. And so you can see it's a monster. Um, there's a reason why we use this one and I'll kind of get to that in a, in a moment. Um, and then we also have this guy over here. So this is our uh, Canon uh, XF305. This is kind of what we use for running gun type stuff. Um, and it really, comp we use, we're starting to use it more on weekends and that kind of stuff too. So, so those are, those are kind of our cameras that we kind of have in the house. Um, but we'll kind of step through like the different parts of cameras now and I'll explain what the, what the difference is kind of in these guys as we go along. So um, with cameras, digital cameras now, they have sensors. So at, in the old style um, film and photo cameras, they used to have like actual film. Do you guys remember those film canisters that you'd have to go and get developed and that kind of stuff? So since then, they've developed the, the digital sensor. And so each one of these cameras has a digital sensor in it, but they have, there's two different types of sensors. There's an older style and then the new one that's kind of starting to take over. So um, there's the CCD, which is more expensive, uh, but it has less noise just because the way that it processes um, images and that kind of stuff. Um, they kind of look like this. Um, you have your, your CCD, I think on this side, this is the CMOS, I believe. Um, could be either one, either or. But the sensor basically is the thing that captures the image. And so the, the different technologies capture them in different ways. Um, and there's benefits and downsides to both. So um, all of these cameras right here are CMOS sensors which is kind of a newer technology which they've been developing. That's what basically your phone has in it. That's what these guys have in it, even this little guy. Um, this is the only one that actually has a C, uh, CD uh, sensor in it. So the nice thing is it has a little, it has less uh, digital noise, um, you know, when you're doing low light and that kind of stuff. Um, even this guy has a CMOS sensor. So just two different technologies and they just process the image um, a little differently, but um, pretty similar um, for the most part. So that's the sensor. Um, the next thing about the sensor is the, the size of the sensor. So these cameras, they might look the same, um, these two, but they actually have two different size sensors on it. So this one, the 5D Mark III here, or this is actually the two, um, has a full frame sensor. So what that means is that um, it has uh, a 36 by 24 millimeter sensor. So that's what we call a full frame sensor. That's kind of the for the most part, the largest sensor that we work with. Um, and then you have the 7D right here, which actually has a crop sensor, or it's called the Super 35. And the Super 35, it has a 24.6 by 13 millimeter sensor. So it's just a little bit smaller. Um, and I'll pass this around, um, so you can kind of look inside of it, but um, just be careful with them. You can kind of see there's very much a difference in the size of the the sensor just from looking at the mirror. So the sensor is down inside, that's a mirror reflecting it. So you can kind of see the size difference. Um, and then you have these two guys, and I believe this is, I think this one's still the ACPS, I believe. So it's the same size as that um, 70. And then this guy right here is called micro third, or maybe this is a micro four thirds as well. So they have a little bit smaller sensor even still. So 
Um, and I think these guys are both um, one third inch uh, sensor as well. Um, so with the different sensor sizes, that, that has some benefits and downsides. Um, we'll kind of go into that in a little bit when we talk about lenses and how they interact with, with the cameras because it makes a huge difference. So with all of these cameras, they have a thing called shutter. Shutter is um, the, the mechanism that stops light from hitting the sensor. And so the, the more light that you allow to hit the sensor, the more exposure that you get, the less light that you have to hit the sensor, the less exposure that you're gonna get. So um, if you want, if you're working in the low light, you need a longer shutter if you're working in, it's, well in photography and, and specifically. Um, and then if you're working in bright, you need a really fast shutter. And so um, all of these guys have shutters and you have to know how that shutter interacts with the sensor um, and so on. And so um, with the sensor or the shutter, should say. Um, in video, we kind of work with a very specific set of shutter speeds. So like in photography, you'll see anything from like uh, a really long exposure, like a couple minutes, like if you're doing like a star, starry night type thing, but you have a really long shutter or a really fast shutter um, for really bright environments. Um, in, in video, we tend to see specific shutter speeds and it's all determined based on the frame rate that you are recording in. So we have 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 60, and 120. And, and most people are familiar with those nowadays just because your camera, your iPhone and that kind of stuff already has that in it. Um, so you know, like when you're, you can record at 120, which is basically allows you to do like slow-mo footage and that kind of stuff. Um, how many of you guys know what format is usually recorded in for like cinema? and like movies and that kind of stuff. Anybody can guess? 24, yep, 24. And there's a very specific reason for it. So 24 tends to give you that kind of nice motion blur. Um, it's at 30 frames per second is where you start to see like, it looks really like live. It's like I am right here in front of you guys. But 24 gives you that kind of cinematic feel and that's been around for a long time. And so then we have 60 frames per second which if you guys watch our stream, that's kind of what we're recording in, sort of, um, is 60 frames per second. So our cameras here are actually recording in a different, and we're actually converting it uh, to a 60. So a broadcaster is 59.94, yeah. it's basically wireless. Mm -hmm. Well, there's 120 frames per second, which your phone can do. Um, but it, even if you guys have ever watched like super slow mo footage of like glass breaking and that kind of stuff, that f frames per second is going to skyrocket. And you can go up to now, now, like a lot of the newer phones are going to 240, mm -hmm. even, which is like an ultra slow mo. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that's all frames per second is how many frames per second. So you take um, 60 frames in one minute or seconds. So that's how you or take it, this guy. So. Frames per second, um, and so with shutter speed, um, what we what we do is we actually double the frame the frame. So, and what this is called is the 180 degree rule. So in in old style film cameras, they would have a shutter that has like two holes on it on each side, and that shutter would spin, and then it would expose the film that many times per second. And so that's kind of how that was made up. Now in digital, it's a little bit done differently, but they still use the same term. So one by 48, or so if it's 24 frames per second, it's one by 48 or 150, because some cameras and stuff can't do 48. So you just double it and that's how you get your shutter speed. And so the nice thing about this is a lot of these are like hard and fast type rules. Um, and then you can tweak them in order to do an artistic thing, but it's really easy to set up and then you just have to tweak some of these other, other settings in order to get the right exposure. So the next thing is uh, aperture. How many of you guys know what an aperture is? Yeah. You wanna tell me what it is? No, I just heard of it. Um, okay. So aperture is, um, there's a little, a guy in here that actually adjusts how wide um, this lens is. So if you guys go through here, um, you can kind of see this, the aperture opening and closing. So I'll pass this around. But if you move this dial and look inside, you'll see the aperture uh, 
expanding, contracting. And what this does is it controls how much light enters the sensor. Um, so if it's wide open, more light. If it's less open, less light. And what that does is that controls your depth of field. So how, like you guys know the, the new iPhones, they have this like depth, uh, like, um, well, I can't remember what it's called now, but portrait it's mode. portrait mode, yep. So it, allowed, it puts the background fuzzy. Um, and that's all just like a digital computerized thing. But with this, if it's wide open, you have a really shallow depth of field, which means like there's only a little bit that's in focus. So you have to be really careful about um, where you're running that. And if your subject's here, they move here to the camera, they're gonna be out of focus. And so you have to kind of ride that um, aperture in order to keep things in focus and that kind of stuff. If you have it at a really um, closed aperture, then there's gonna be a lot more things in focus. Um, and so that's all uh, depth of field. Um, and so the next thing is ISO. ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. So like um, how much um, light um, is hitting the sensor and how sensitive that is to the light. So the lower the number, the um, less sensitive, the higher the, them, the higher the number, the more sensitive. And the higher the number, the more digital noise that it is. Because it's kind of like an amplifier. If you turn up the amplifier on a channel, you're gonna to tend to get more noise in your channel and that kind of stuff. Less gain um, is less noise. And so, um, that, what does ISO stand for? Uh, International Standard or Standards Organization. Oh. So it's just like a unified set of measurements. It's funny because it's a term for, for that, but it's not like really descriptive of that. So with the aperture too, um, those are actually told in f-stops. If you look on that lens, the, it'll tell you like 1.4 or 1.6 and um, up to like 22 and stuff like that. So um, how many of you guys have worked with electrical wire and stuff like that? It's kind of like that. The, the smaller the number, the thicker the gauge. Same with this. The smaller the number, the more open the, the aperture is. And the smaller the number, the, um, yeah, the opposite. So. So we'll quick go over those again. Uh, so shutter is how much light hits the sensor. The aperture is how much light, or sorry, how long the light hits the sensor. How much uh, light hits the sensor is the aperture, which is depth of field. The shutter is the motion blur. And the ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. So those three things are in each one of these. And you have to kind of know how to mix those in order to get the right exposure. And so, what, um, like what I said before, you start with your frames per second, like what do you want to shoot in? So you shoot in 24 frames per second, 30 or 60. So you figure that out first, and then you set your, set your shutter speed, which a lot of these are kind of auto shutter speed. What it'll say is like 180 degree, and that just automatically doubles your shutter. These guys right here, you'll actually have to set them um, because they're photography cameras that can do video. And so you have to um, just be on the watch for that. You either set the, set the shutter speed, which is a ratio here, um, or you look for that 180 degree, which is like on the 305s. Um, and then, um, yeah, just set your, your sensitivity to ISO. Like on these cameras right here, um, there's broadcast cameras, they talk about it in gain. So you have low gain, medium gain, high gain. It's the same thing. And then even in these guys, you can tell it like how much you can, you want to do it. It's all in like dust DB ratings. And let's say that, um, that something isn't bright enough. Um, so if you have this lens on your camera and you're running it, full open at 1.4 and it's still not enough light. What you would do probably is either adjust your ISO or your sensitivity or your gain, all those are the same, uh, bump it up in order to be able to see more or you need to light 
the the subject and that kind of stuff more. So as, are, as you increase that gain, you're also introducing more noise. To yeah. You. So because like you have a signal and you have your, the noise or the like mm -hmm. junk that you're picking up, and as you increase your gain, you're also increasing that the noise. That noise too. So just be yeah. conscious of that. So it's it's usually best to run on low gain because that's less noise. If you have to do it like medium and that kind of stuff, that's kind of the sacrifice that you make. Um, otherwise, more light. So when you do it with the lens with the aperture, you're doing it mechanically. Yep. And then when you do it with the camera, you're doing it digitally. Digitally. Exactly. Okay. digitally you're turning with, up the, the, with the gain or the ice. You're amplifying. So you want to try to do it mechanically first mm -hmm. before you increase that. Exactly. Okay. Um, but then you also have to remember that the the wide or the wider the aperture, so like you also your your really shallow depth of field, so you could have a hard time oh. keeping somebody in focus. And so if instead of running at a one point four, um, if you run at a four, that would mean more things are in focus, but that means you need more light. So the next thing is if it's too bright, like if you have your guy all the way cranked down as small as it goes, letting it as, as least amount of light as you can. The next step that you have to do is um, look at ND filters, which is a neutral density filter, which basically cuts the amount of light that goes through the lens. Um, and a lot of these cameras have it. This guy has an ND filter built in. That C100 has an ND filter built right in. And you just turn that up in order to cut the amount of light coming into the sensor. It's not built in. They have little rings, basically, that you would just fix on the front mm -hmm. of the lens. Yes. Yeah, and in lighting, they have gel um, to be able to cut the light of your light fixtures and that kind of stuff. So, so now we're going to talk about um, uh, interlaced versus progressive. So there's different recording formats. So we talked about 24, 30, 60. Um, the next thing is interlaced versus progressive. So this is really common because up until the last couple of years, interlace has been a thing. Even if you're watching like over the air television and that kind of stuff, that's all interlace signal, unless it's specifically broadcasting 720p, which some do, including um, like ESPN. ESPN broadcasts in 720p. Um, and the reason for that is, is this. So interlaced basically cuts, um, stuff in half into diff two different fields in order to decrease bandwidth. So if you had just one frame of, of like this each as a progressive format, that consumes a whole lot more bandwidth. And so for television and that kind of stuff, um, what it does is it splits it into two fields and it puts it together to kind of make a whole image. Um, the downside about this is that you'll see interlaced lines. So, but this is kind of a broadcast standard is this 1080i um, format. And so, you know, over the air television uses this um, and you'll sometimes see it. So that's kind of the downside. So if you start to see lines in your image that are horizontal like that, um, that's probably why. And so it tends to be better to like record in a progressive format because you don't have to worry about that. And then interlacing is particularly noticeable when you have motion. If it's, exactly. if it's a standstill image, it's not usually as noticeable. Yeah, and that's why ESPN uses it for sports because it's a high, high, quick image type stuff. So you start to see that more. Um, this guy right here, um, this camera, is can either do 1080i, 5994. So 5994 is the frame rate. Um, or 720p 5994. You get either one of those two. And so ESPN would use the 720. We use the 1080 in order to get that little bit more resolution, which is then cut down a little bit by using interlaced. Um, but that's kind of the two broadcast standards. Um, and they're starting to go up or starting to progress beyond that as we look toward 4K and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's interlaced. And so when possible, we try not to use interlaced, but like with broadcast type stuff, it tends to be inevitable. So because that's what they use for like artificial like slow mode to like give you faster frames per second, right? Is that what they use? I don't think so. Because like I know like on like your phone, like if you go like I think it's um you can record 1080. 
HD at 120 frames per second, but if you want to report 240 frames per second for slow mode, then it reduces your, um, it reduces it to 720. Is that the same thing? Um, yeah, it's all about bandwidth and processing in that regard. So if you want to get a higher frame rate, it uses more processing. So like on your phone and that kind of stuff, it'll actually jump down to 720 in order to get that faster frame rate because your phone can only has so many, much resources in its processor. So that's just choosing what you're gonna sacrifice, either resolution or if you wanna get a faster, uh, for slow-mo and that kind of stuff, you go to seven, down to 720 and that kind of thing, so. Yeah. So this guy um, can do uh, 1080i, 59i, and 4 as well. And that's how we in, um, how to interact with our uh, broadcast stuff. So it's a little bit about that. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is lenses. Um, so how many of you guys are familiar with like lenses for photography and cinema and that kind of stuff or um, use your iPhone? So, so this guy is a 70 to, uh, to 200 millimeters. So this is like a long lens. Um, and this guy is more of a short lens. So like a wider angle versus a telephoto um, lens. So all that to say, you have to kind of look at how far away your subject's gonna be in order to determine what lens you're going to use. Um, but there are some um, aspects in order to consider uh, when you're looking at lenses. So with each one of these sensors, we're going to go back to the size of the sensor. It makes a big difference on how the, the image looks after it goes uh, to the sensor. So, um, so this is the full frame sensor. So if I put this lens on uh, this 5D, camera, it's gonna look like this. So it's full frame. So it's getting that full uh, image because that sensor is bigger. But when you put this lens on this 7D camera, it's a crop sensor. So it can only, um, so it changes kind of how the, what the sensor is able to receive. Um, so it actually ends up being able to just see this green part. So using the same lens, you get two different, um, like areas that it's able to see. Frames, frames. Yeah. And so, and with this micro four third, which is gonna be like uh, this guy or um, um, this guy, or even some other cameras, it's gonna look more like this red one. So you just have to be careful with um, how your lens interacts with your sensor. Um, and so like these guys right here, actually have that, this ACP sensor. And so um, you look more zoomed in than you do with the full frame sensor. But the benefit to like a full frame sensor that you can get really close up to your subject. So if you are using the full frame sensor with like a 24 millimeter lens, you're able to get really, really close, but still able to see pretty wide. So the benefit of that is if you're shooting in like close quarters, um, it's really beneficial for that type of thing. Um, but if you're like trying to shoot, uh, see somebody on stage um, with your lens, that's not going to cut it because they're going to look like this. And so, um, getting a more telephoto lens to be able to see see that is is beneficial. Is that what GoPro like bends like the image and gives mm -hmm. a little fishing effect to compensate for how small the sensor is? Yeah. So that's um, actually even just the lens. The lens is a wide angle lens, and so it's kind of like this. Um, Actually, that guy is a wide angle lens. So it just is naturally like really wide. And this is kind of like even just about like a fisheye lens. Um, it's, so it's not so much, the sensor is smaller, but the lens is actually really wide. And that's where we get that kind of uh, distortion around the edges where it's like, that's not, that's a straight line that looks curved in the image. Um, that's part of like understanding how the lens interacts with the sensor because you start to see like those distortions around the edges um, if you have a really wide lens. It's great if you're trying to get a really wide um, image, um, but it tends to get those distortions. So the kind of the rule of thumb that we talked about is, uh, or it's similar to the, the shutter speed, but when you're looking at a normal lens, so this is kind of like mimicking your eye. So if you were to like use your eye as kind of uh, a normative um, standard, um, this is how you kind of, of um, 
and you can kind of tell if you'll get that distortion or not. So with a full frame sensor, um, you're going to use a, a 43 millimeter lens or like even a 35 millimeter lens um, tends to look more natural. Um, like if you're looking on a computer screen and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you want to like show it on a screen, like in the cinema, what they tend to use is more of like an 80 millimeter lens because you're so far away from the screen. It seems more natural to your eye um, to use that. And so you just kind of double it. So in a crop center, 24 um, by 50 and then micro four thirds, um, basically the same thing. So that's kind of how the lens inter interacts with the sensor. Um, and knowing that helps in determining what lens you're going to use. So the next part is uh, about the different types of mounts. And so with different camera uh, lenses, they tend to use different mounts. So like a Canon uses a thing called EF mounts, and that's just how the lens connects to the camera. So this is an EF mounted lens. Um, and it just like pushes in and twists. Um, and this is an EF mount as well. Um, with Nikon, it's called an, an F, uh, F lens. So it, it just has an F mount. Um, and PL is the professional cinema lenses. So like those are really, can be really expensive lenses. Um, and then uh, ENG lenses, which is like this guy. So this is an EN, ENG lens. And the nice thing about this one is it's also a parafocal lens, um, which means that if you're zoomed all the way in or zoomed all the way out, it will retain the focus of, of um, either distance. And so the nice thing is you can like zoom in on your subject, focus, and then back out. And whether you're zooming or not, it'll stay in focus. With like these guys, um, if you're zooming in and out, you'll have to readjust your focus. Um, depending on if you're zoomed in or not. So the nice thing about the ENG lens, it's a it's a broadcast lens. So this is like your your news broadcast, stuff like that. Um, it's a lot easier for like run and gun because you can stay in focus if you're zooming in and out. Um, and it has also these electronic controls. So like for um, zooming in, setting iris and stuff like that. So, um, and even like this guy is a more, uh, it's ENG style uh, camera. Um, so then kind of lastly, um, each one of these guys records onto different media differently. And so that's another thing to be aware of. So you guys might recognize this. There's SD cards, CF cards. Uh, some other cameras use like proprietary SSDs um, along with um, <coughs> Like this guy doesn't even record, have a recording thing. You actually have to have an outboard gear in order to record. Um, CF card stands for compact flash. SD cards for stands for secure digital. Digital. Um, you guys probably recognize them, but they record uh, record stuff differently. So this guy tends to be or can be faster because it has more pins and that kind of stuff. So better um, better for that. So like this guy here uses an SD card, um, this 305 uses a CF card. Um, some of the newer stuff even use, like really, you have to have really, really fast um, memory because you're recording 4K and that kind of stuff. Um, but in picking out like even your CF card and your SD card, you have to be pay attention to like the speeds. So this guy is a 64 gigabyte 400X which stands for like how fast it can read it and write. And different cameras will require different speeds because of the, the bandwidth it uses um, in order to record. And so um, just be, pay attention to that. You have to look at like the different manufacturers that you're working with and look at its recommendations and that kind of stuff. So just another thing to be aware of, just so that way you're not buying something and like, why is it working? It could be that your stuff's too slow. Um, so yeah, it's kind of all I have. But so I was just learning about our 305 the other day a bit, and I noticed that you can like dual record because there's two slots. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the benefit? Is that just basically a backup? Um, it's a failover potentially. So like, if you have, you know, your your CF card 
only can take an hour's worth of footage, mm -hmm. then it would like go to the secondary one if you go past that hour. Oh, so it still is only recording on one. I and think it, it, so. it can't record on both simultaneously, as far yeah. as I know. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. Okay, I see. So it's basically just adding extra memory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Another set of so. Okay. But the nice thing now, like, you get 64, 128. I don't even know what you can go up to on CF cards, but a lot of times it's like a couple hours of that you can record onto mm -hmm. it. But like, even we have SD cards now that have 512 gigabytes. And you can record like six hours of footage on like a really mm -hmm. on a ProRes codec or something like that. So, can you talk about codecs at all too? Yeah, that was one thing that I like, especially well when we got the Black Magic um, recorder that we talked about, like just figuring out which one to use because one of them just sucked up memory super fast. Yeah. And it's all about quality. So there's a couple different formats or codecs that are, that are widely used. There's H.264, which is a more heavily compressed video format, but still gives you great compression and a good outcome. So like it is good minimal image loss. at lower file format. Minimal loss, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now even there's uh, H.265 or um, HEVC is the new thing. So it's the next step, uh, next generation of H.264, which is even better compression um, at lower bandwidth or lower storage. So like um, all the Apple stuff, the latest OS just brought on HEVC. And so it's gonna be the next thing that's coming down the pipe. And it's great because if you're recording a 4K, that's like a huge amount of like video uh, to store. And so um, the next thing is ProRes. ProRes has been, has been around for a long time. It's less compression. It's kind of, it's very, it's kind of like professional grade uh, recording. So you have a lot less compression, which means that you potentially have less loss in your quality and that kind of stuff. Um, so like I know our black magics here, all the lowest that it can record is like ProRes Yep. Um, standard or whatever, okay. and then there's like HQ. There's different like flavors of ProRes. Yeah, I think the one where it uses like ProRes LT maybe. Or it's probably like long play, so it's like yeah. more compression that kind of stuff. And that uses more storage, um, but then you have that less loss. And then the next, um, so those are the basic two. But then you start to get in like manufacturer specific codecs, and so. Like this guy will record in, it might be H.264, but like the C100 records in uh, a format and it has like, it's called that, I think an MXF wrapper. So then you actually have to go through a, a video editing software in order to, to edit it. So you have to import it and then it puts it all together. Same with this guy, it has a, MXF wrapper around that the thing for compression and stuff like that. Um, that's a little bit harder to work with, but yeah, the standards are kind of like H.264 and now HEVC or H.265 and ProRes. Um, but then there's like lots of difference between different manufacturers, but um, yeah. So depending on if you have the option, like you need more storage with to be able to record longer H.265 is going to get you more. So like when we render off for weekends and that kind of stuff, we'll use H.264 uh, to be able to upload to Vimeo, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Um, but like on our S SD recorders, like HyperDex and stuff like that, it's all ProRes. And then you just send it through like Premiere and compress it down to H.264. So. There's others too, like uncompressed. That's basically like a bit for bit raw. onto raw um, mm -hmm. recording, which is, <laughs> eats a ton. Massive. Yeah. So like in uncompressed, um, just to give you an idea. So if we were to take an hour's worth of footage at 1080i, 5994, um, that's going to be about 500 gigabytes of storage. Now, if we do ProRes, it's gonna be like 90 to 100 gigabytes. And then H.264 is gonna be more around like that 
five to 10 kilobytes. So you can just kind of see. And that's all about like compression, how much it's trying to shrink the file. And it uses algorithms in order to kind of interpolate the image and compress it down even more so. Yeah, a lot of crazy stuff. And there, the nice thing is there's lots of like calculators out there. If you go to like AJA, they have a calculator to be able to determine like at ProRes with this much time, how big of a file is this gonna be? So that way you're not like in trouble when you're out in the field and you're like, oh, we just ran out of media and I don't have anywhere to dump it, so.